Good evening, I'm Zinclea Samoa, coming to you from NBC News headquarters in New York City. Here are some of the stories we're following on now tonight. The showdown continues. We are now in day three of voting for a House speaker, and lawmakers may be getting closer to a deal. What is the end game? How does this end? Return to Idaho. The suspect accused of slaying four college students appears in court. We'll have more on the shocking new details that allegedly link him to the murders. And death penalty debate. A South Carolina court takes on methods of execution. We'll dig into the arguments when it comes to the electric chair and even a firing squad. Plus, royal bombshell ahead of his book release, Prince Harry reportedly describes a physical altercation with his brother, Prince William. I think it really plays into or is played by the air spare. We begin tonight with congressional gridlock we haven't seen in a century. The House has voted a whopping 11 times for a speaker for the 118th Congress. And they're not done yet. Maybe it's because Mercury is in retrograde, or maybe it's a sign of our divisive political times. Either way, if you weren't watching the House floor all day, here's what you missed. A speaker has not been elected. A speaker has not been elected. A speaker has not been elected. Speaker has not been elected. If you didn't get the message, that is Cheryl Johnson, clerk of the House of Representatives. She's in charge of the House until a speaker is elected. So far, she has made that exact statement 11 times. Once for each failed vote, bringing Congress to a standstill. So far, the Republican caucus has not been able to come together. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy has been unable to take the speakership. And right at this very moment, the House is voting on whether to adjourn until tomorrow. Joining us now to talk about this is Ryan Nobles, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent. Another evening, another set of votes, and he's covered every single one. So, Ryan, let's start with the basics here. The House is voting right now on a motion to adjourn. I can hear a lot of commotion behind you. So where do we stand and are Republicans any closer to choosing a speaker? Maybe, Sinclair. <laughs> it's hard to say. Uh, I think I'm going to have that uh, the clerk's uh, message ringing in my ears all night because uh, it seems like uh, this is just something that's gone on over and over again. But there is a degree of progress right now. We know that Republicans have been behind closed doors all day long, that Kevin McCarthy and his negotiating team has offered up uh, the conservative breakaway caucus uh, yet another deal with a long list of concessions in the hopes of trying to get McCarthy some votes back. Uh, the hope right now is that, at least for Republicans, that they have enough votes right now to adjourn for the night, to give them the opportunity to kind of, to kind of go through the, the fine details of this proposal and then find out whether or not, or not it is enough votes to ultimately win the speakership for Kevin McCarthy. As it stands right now, Zinclay, what most of these members are telling us is that it will help him, it will get him some of those votes. They're describing it as phase one. The problem for him is it's not yet enough enough to get him to 218. You're talking about those five members who've described themselves as never Kevins. Mm. Uh, this deal is not going to change their mind, at least not yet. And we're rightly focusing on Republicans, but what about the Democrats? Are they going to stay united with their 212 votes for Hakeem Jeffries? Oh, for sure, uh, Zinkley. I mean, I, perhaps the only thing that could happen in terms of Democrats uh, is that they get bored with this process, right? Because they're doing the same thing over and over again. It's going late into the night. Many of them have their families in town uh, because this is supposed to be kind of a celebratory week as they get sworn into Congress. But Democrats have done a very good job of making sure that their members are in the chamber every single time a vote takes place because if for some reason there aren't enough Democrats in the in the chamber, that reduces the number of votes that Kevin McCarthy needs to get in order to become the speaker. So they've been here every single time, all in attendance, all voting only for Hakeem Jeffries. So, you know, on the long list of possibilities, the one at the very bottom is uh, the idea that somehow there could be some sort of a negotiation between Democrats and Republicans to get Kevin McCarthy over the finish line. That would mean a lot of concessions to Democrats about the way the rules of the House operate over the next two years. Mm. There are some Democrats that would like that to happen. So far, no Republican is talking about that happening. And, and there are probably still a lot of Democrats that wouldn't even agree to those terms if Kevin McCarthy is the name at the top of the list.
And Ryan, it's not lost on me the impacts and effects of this, right? Because it's not just Washington fanfare. It impacts the country as a whole. I know there are concerns that the standstill could keep Capitol Hill staffers from getting paid. So can you tell us more about the people working on the Capitol? How is this affecting them and the constituents of so many of these representatives? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great point. This is, you know, drama. It it's, makes for good uh, cable television watching throughout the day, but there are real-world consequences here. We do not have a functioning House of Representatives right now. Uh, in order to pass laws, to appropriate money, to do a lot of different things, there has to be members of the House of Representatives to vote on these pieces of legislation. They cannot be sworn into office until they pick a speaker. So. Uh, members of the House Administration Committee have warned staffers on committees uh, that if there are, isn't a rules package agreed to by January 13th, that they're not going to get their paychecks because there are essentially no committees right now because that's part of the organizi organizing that has to take place after the new speaker is sworn in. And, you know, there's other national security implications. None of these members are able to get national security briefings. Uh, they've been told that they can't meet with high-level government officials because they don't have security clearances right now because they're technically not members of Congress. Uh, this is a thing that's happening right now, and the longer that this drags on, the longer that these real-world consequences will become uh, even more uh, sober and real uh, if they can't ultimately come to a deal. Yeah, important conclusion. This is urgent not just for the speaker, but for many just general Americans. NBC's Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Now let's bring in senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. John, jumping in here, 11 votes. The record is over 120. And at this point, the vote totals aren't getting closer to a winner. So vote shifted not toward Kevin McCarthy. What is your sense of his handle of the caucus right now, if there is one? Well, let's just pray uh, on behalf of the clerk of the House, Cheryl Johnson, that we don't get to 129 or 130 ballots before there's a Speaker of the House. Um, you know, look, the Republican conference is uh, riven right now over the simplest of questions, which is who should lead them, uh, which means not only uh, will they have trouble electing a Speaker, but imagine as they try to do things like fund the government, lift a debt ceiling, hard, complicated, substantive things, um, you're looking at a party that is uh, deeply divided and, you know, in chaos. Often people talk about Democrats being in disarray and having a variety of views. And right now you're seeing the Republican mm. Party in as bad a disarray as I've ever seen it. And I think to that end, what concessions has Leader McCarthy made today alone, right? Because obviously he's needing to make some in order to get these votes that he's hoping for. Yeah, he's starting to offer things like uh, lowering the threshold for a motion to vacate the chair, meaning uh, getting rid of the speaker down to one uh, member that can make that motion. Of course, there'd still have to be a vote of the whole House, but whoever made that motion would probably get the vote of, vote of all the Democrats to get rid of Kevin McCarthy in the future. Uh, there's talk of uh, adding some of the uh, House Freedom Caucus members. Uh, the, the extreme conservatives to the Rules Committee, which would make it easier for them to try to get amendments put in play uh, on substantive issues uh, as bills come to the floor, uh, and a whole variety of other things that have been on the table. Last night, we already saw an agreement from uh, McCarthy's uh, super PAC, or the one that's aligned with him, uh, to not go after or to, to not spend money in uh, Republican primaries and safely Republican seats, uh, which brought along uh, the Club for Growth um, to, to be supportive, uh, an outside group on the right to be supportive of McCarthy. But uh, so far, this is not moving the votes in the chamber. Right. And Jonathan, I have to tell you, as we've been speaking, the House has officially adjourned following 11 failed votes. And I know even as they've been discussing tonight, Trump's name was formally put into nomination. So can you talk to us about the Trump effect here? It seems everywhere in our midterms and now this. How is the former president playing into this? I mean, really, the biggest effect is that he uh, endorsed McCarthy and it was worthless for McCarthy. Uh, you know, on Wednesday morning, Trump came out with this very full-throated public endorsement on Truth Social. He had already been on the phone with some of these members, uh, trying to get them to go in McCarthy's direction. Then there was a little bit of a hiccup when our colleague Garrett Hake called him, and Trump's response uh, to his question about McCarthy was, we'll see what happens. Uh, it was taken broadly as Trump backing off of McCarthy, so then he had to redouble his 
endorsement of McCarthy, and then uh, nobody voted, nobody changed votes in favor of McCarthy. I talked to some of the members uh, who um, were the holdouts. One of them, Ralph Norman from South Carolina, said he really appreciates what Trump did for the country, but he said, this is our fight. Hmm. Well, 11 failed votes later. We know you'll keep us posted on what's to come. NBC's John Allen, thank you so much. The other major story tonight, crews are cleaning up the damage from a powerful storm on the west coast in Northern California. Two deaths are being blamed on the system, which brought strong winds, flooding, rain, and feet, yes, feet, of snow. Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens with the forecast. Bill, this is just storm number one. So what more can we expect? What should we be looking for? Well, I'm glad you're going to keep track because there's <laughs> going to be so many in the next like week that it's going to be like, all right, what number are we on now? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's first show you some of the pictures of what happened. And some of the worst of the damage was actually caused by huge waves. Remember, this was a bomb cycle. This was a huge storm off the coast. This is the Capitola area. You can see the pier there. They lost a section of it. There's a couple of businesses on the out outer portions of the pier that still remain standing, but they did have issues. And you can see just how high the water was there. Significant damage there along the boardwalk and in some of those backyards in that walkway there, right along where the river meets the coast. Other images and other pictures, we had a lot, significant amount of wind damage that was done. We had a lot of trees that were falling that fell on structures like you see there. We had a couple of trees that fell on cars where people had to be rescued that were in the trees. I know in Sonoma County, uh, just north of San Francisco, where a lot of the big trees are, they're all over the place. There's branches. It's a mess and that's where a lot of the power outages did occur. So let's kind of walk you through what we're going to expect for the cleanup period. So the Santa Rosa area all the way into San Francisco, that's where some of the worst flooding had occurred. Now we're going to get a break. The heavy rain has come to an end. We're still getting it up in the mountains with the heavy snow. Already reports of one to two feet of snow. They'll probably get another foot later on tonight. Los Angeles, all your heavy rain is also gone. And if you focus in on the San Francisco area, it was this afternoon with that last batch of heavy rain went through and at that time we had significant amounts of flash flooding that was reported and river flooding and that still exists now so that's north of San Jose the Bay Area all the way up through Napa that's where the rivers are running really high right now the coastal areas because of those large waves in the next high tide cycle that's what we're also concerned with some additional damage possible so pummeled by West Coast storms let's take you through Friday much of the day we're okay it's a cleanup day after the sun sets the heavy rain comes in notice the Bay Area is okay Napa should be fine but it's Northern California and a little further to the north into Oregon that we're going to focus some of the heavier rain and that continues right into Saturday morning. It's not until Saturday about midday that some of that rain kicks through Southern California and Central California. Not enough for significant impacts but we may have some minor isolated flooding and then let's fast forward. Let's go all the way out to Sunday with another storm coming on shore. So I added it all up. I took all of these storms that we're going to get in the next couple days. We're going to get three of them. So we're going to have three atmospheric rivers. Minor one on Saturday Saturday I showed you, and then possible bigger impacts Monday and then next Thursday. And this is the rainfall totals. This yellow is five inches, seven to ten inches in the mountains. San Francisco, five to ten additional inches. And by the way, this has been the wettest start that they've ever had uh, to a year in San Francisco, obviously with the storms that we've had over New Year's and this one. And then the rainfall forecast as we're going to go into the weekend, that next Pacific storm comes in. That's going to be Saturday, Sunday, heavy rain and snow. And then I think we get an even bigger ones in clay on Monday. So, yeah, oh. it's just one after another. I was going to say, West Coast can't get a break. But there is some good news. Like, mm. we had the huge drought, right, with the reservoirs. Mm. The Oroville Dam is up 55 feet since the beginning of December. So wow. these, we need the water. We just don't need it this, this much. Like, in two weeks. <laughs> well, we know you'll be following it closely. Bill Karens, thank you so much. And the concern in Southern California right now is flooding. Earlier today, one person had to be rescued by a helicopter in Ventura County. That person trapped by rising floodwaters from the Ventura River. In L.A., video shows a rain swollen Los Angeles River. Officials are especially concerned for people who live alongside creeks and channels, as well as 
the homeless community. With me now is Ahmad Chapman. He is communications director for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Welcome and thank you for joining us during this time. So just first, what is the situation in L.A. right now? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, before I, I, I dive too far into that, I'm from Northern California, so I just want to let everybody know up there that uh, my thoughts and prayers are still with you as as you uh, dry out from the latest storm. Mm. Um, here, you know, we finally got a, a break in the weather, and uh, frankly, we're beginning to prepare uh, for the next effort to uh, get people um, inside to to shelter. Um, and to safer areas. Uh, LASA is working alongside our partners at LAPD, LA Fire, uh, LA Parks and Rangers, um, the Sheriff's Department, um, uh, all to get into these uh, rivers um, and flood channels, uh, et cetera, um, to talk to people, um, help them get into a shelter um, that we have available and uh, um, otherwise get them the tools that they need um, to weather the storm and, and get to locations that are safe. And Ahmad, I imagine right now, given the crisis we're talking about, demand is really high. So how are shelters able to handle the demand right now for those coming off the street? There is a lot of demand for our shelters. Um, we are uh, in the midst of a uh, homelessness crisis just in, in general. And so our, our uh, shelters um, do run pretty full. Um, one of the things that we do uh, every year to uh, help bring about more space is we open up a program called the Winter Shelter Program. Uh, this is a program that runs through the winter months to allow folks uh, to have an opportunity to come inside uh, to a warm spot, uh, get three meals a day, um, and talk to some of our caseworkers uh, to get on a path to permanent housing. When we experience inclement weather or severe weather like we've just had, um, we also open up what we call an augmented winter shelter program. In this case, or for this year, um, mm -hmm. we uh, are opening up uh, hotel and motel vouchers um, for folks to use uh, so that way they can find uh, and go to a hotel closest to, to them uh, to get out of the, the rain um, and uh, be safer. Right now, uh, that program is activated and it's running until um, the end of next week. That's great. And I mean, we heard from Bill, right? There will be upcoming storms. How concerned are you about those? Uh, it's uh, always a concern, and it's something that is always on our outreach team's minds. Um, this is, we do not set up um, our efforts purely when a storm is coming. Our outreach workers, along with the partners uh, from city and county that I listed earlier, are constantly out talking to folks, getting to know them, getting to know their needs. So that way, when times like these come around, um, they can go back. There's a good rapport there, and they can help somebody um, get to a safer place, whether that be inside uh, the shelter to our augmented program, uh, as I mentioned before, or um, just a place where uh, we know of potential floodwaters won't get to them. So the work is always ongoing. Um, our teams who do heroes work are always engaged, and we're just going to keep that going uh, no matter what nature brings us. Absolutely. The work continues. Ahmad Chapman, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for your time. And coming up, two big stories we're watching closely on Now Tonight. New disturbing information about the Idaho murder suspect, how DNA at the crime scene led to his arrest, plus signs of remarkable improvement. That's what the Buffalo Bills are saying about safety. Damar Hamlin, who, according to doctors, even asked who won Monday night's game. You know, when, when he asked, did we win, the answer is yes. You know, Damar, you won. You won the game of life. Uh, and that's probably the most important thing out of this. Brian Koberger, the suspect in the murder of four college students, made his first court appearance in Idaho today. He was extradited there from his home state of Pennsylvania just last night, and his arrival in the state unseals the probable cause affidavit supporting his arrest. It reveals disturbing new details of the night of the crime, as well as how law enforcement was able to track him down. Joining us now from Moscow, Idaho, to talk about this is NBC's Dana Griffin. Dana, so let's dig into this a bit. A tan knife sheath was found next to one of the victims. How exactly did officials connect that to Koberger? 
Well, then, Clay, investigators say that they found DNA on the button of that knife sheath, and they've been holding on to that DNA. Throughout this investigation, they kind of zeroed in on Brian Kohlberger, and when they went to his parents' house in Pennsylvania, they took some trash, and there was a male profile that they collected. Um, we believe it's his father. And so that's how they were able to do sort of forensic genealogy, and that's when investigators usually take that profile and figure out, okay, who is the closest relative? Who is the closest to the scene? And it, again, linked back to Kohlberger. Sinclair? Really disturbing. And I know the court documents also reveal that one of the Survive Me roommates actually claimed she may have saw and or heard him the evening of the attack. What do you know about that? Yeah, so she came out of her bedroom several times around 4 o'clock that morning. She heard crying, and she even heard who she thought was Kaylee Gonzalez say, there's someone here. Investigators actually believe that that was Zaina Kernodal because phone records indicate that around 4.12 that morning she was on TikTok. She says that she also heard a male's voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm here to help you. She also says that during that last time she opened her door, she saw the man who had his face and nose covered, and he walked toward her and out the back of the home. She stood there frozen, and now the big question is, what happened during that time? Because investigators told us earlier in this investigation that they weren't called until much later that morning, the next day. So what happened in between that is still a mystery, Zinclay. Hmm, a lot of big questions there. And when it comes to today, what was the purpose of the hearing and what comes next after this long wait we've had finding the suspect? So usually in cases like this, the first appearance, it's usually an arraignment and we get to hear whether or not the defendant is going to plead guilty, not guilty. In this case, the judge just read the charges and told Kohlberger that these offenses could land him life in prison or even the death penalty and wanted to know if he was aware of that. He said yes. Uh, they officially named his public defender. And what happens next is there's going to be another hearing a week from today. It's a status hearing. So we hope to learn more on when that arraignment will happen and what will likely take uh, place next in this in this process. Definitely, definitely a case we're watching closely. Dana, thank you so much. Today, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was laid to rest. Pope Francis resided over the historic funeral mass in Vatican City. About 50,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square. But because Benedict was no longer head of state, only two countries sent official delegations, Italy and Germany, where he was born. Here are some of the scenes from earlier today. Of course, it's a beautiful celebration, and I think it represents a lot about his life and uh, what he expected. A simple celebration, but very beautiful. Algo triste, pero it is a sad but meaningful day. Realmente. I wanted to be here so much that I can feel it in my heart. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. As a man who lived through the council and who changed the church uh, as much as he did, it's just really amazing to be here. It's a moment of renewal, I would say so, and a touching moment because it was a, it was a great pop. It was a marvelous pop. Thanks to our Claudio Lavango for that. And after the break, more of the top stories were following this hour, including an update on Damar Hamlin's health after collapsing on the field Monday night. The promising words from his doctors. Plus, he is sp sparing no details. Prince Harry accusing his brother, William, of physically attacking him. And Putin is calling for a 36-hour ceasefire in Ukraine. But will it actually happen? That's all just ahead. Stay close. It's time now for some of the big headlines we're watching on Now Tonight. South Carolina's Supreme Court striking down a six-week abortion ban. The court ruling today that the restriction violates the state's constitutional right to privacy. This decision comes nearly two years after Republican Governor Henry McMaster signed the measure into law. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordering a 36-hour ceasefire in Ukraine in honor of Orthodox Christmas. It's supposed to start midday Friday and last through Saturday night. But Ukraine will likely not follow it. Kyiv is dismissing the move as propaganda and an attempt by Moscow to buy time and regroup. 
In Mexico, alleged drug trafficker Ovidio Guzman is now in custody by the country's security forces. Guzman, the son of former cartel boss El Chapo, is wanted in the U.S. on drug trafficking charges. The high-profile capture comes just days before President Biden is expected in Mexico for talks with President Obrador. Students in Jackson, Mississippi, return to remote learning today due to the ongoing water crisis in their city. All 33 schools in the Jackson public school system are reporting low or no water pressure. Meanwhile, parts of the city remain under a boil water notice. The district says classes will continue remotely tomorrow as well. And get your laptops out. Delta Airlines will soon offer free in-flight Wi-Fi across the board. In the words of the company's CEO, quote, there's no fine print. Officially starting February 1st, Delta joins JetBlue as the only other major U.S. airline to offer the service free for all passengers. Alert and asking questions. That's what the medical team of Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin says about his condition today. The footballer now making remarkable progress. Hamlin is still critically ill in the ICU and on a ventilator. But the big takeaway, he is communicating with doctors and his family. Bills head coach Sean says Hamlin's improvement has been a massive encouragement for both his team and DeMar's family. It's amazing to, to know the impact that this has had on um, so many of so many people and for now Demar to be awake and <clears throat> his mom to be able to share that with him is it's incredible Emotional words there from the team's leader and NBC News correspondent Jay Gray is live outside UC Medical Center in Cincinnati to talk about this. Jay, I know you've been on this all day, so what exactly can and can't Hamlin do right now? Has that changed at all throughout the day? And what more are his doctors saying? Yeah, pretty incredible information, Zinclay, and riveting sound from the coach there of the Bills. You can see how emotional that team is surrounding their teammate who is still inside the hospital here. So let's get straight to what the doctor said today. The first really substantive report we've gotten from the critical care team since he collapsed on Monday night. It was well worth the wait. And let's begin with the most important phrase they used today, no definitive neurological deficit. That means, according to these doctors, that cognitively he seems to be fine. Now, we're not out of the woods. He's still in critical condition, but things are going very well, according to this team. And they feel like that he didn't lose anything uh, cognitively uh, during uh, the time when he was being resuscitated on, on the field. He's moving his hands and feet. He is communicating. He's not speaking. He has a, a breathing tube still inserted. So he's writing answers to questions questions uh, that the doctors are asking, even asking some questions of his own right after he woke up. Here's what the doctors said about that. When he asked, did we win? The answer is yes. You know, Damar, you won. You've won the game of life. It's not only that the lights are on. We know that he's home uh, and that it appears that all, all the cylinders are firing uh, within his brain. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff to hear, Zinclay, and, and, and something that so many people were waiting to hear, not only his teammates, not only the people who have gathered outside the hospital here, but this has grown into such a story, and, and this young man has touched so many lives that you saw the response immediately here outside the hospital. There was singing and dancing, people celebrating online, on social media, so many people weighing in on this report. And, and I think there's one other thing that we ought to point out. Uh, the doctor Doctors today made a point of complimenting uh, just what a great job the medical teams at the stadium did the night he collapsed. In, in fact, saying that things would likely be much different right now had they not acted so quickly. They got to him within a minute, and, and we know a little bit more about what they did. He was on the turf motionless for 16 minutes. Nine of those minutes, they were performing CPR. We knew that. They also used a defibrillator, and uh, they actually inserted a breathing tube there on the field. And, and the doctors here said that was such an important move to get him here and allow them to get to work. 
I mean, Jay, you're touching on the fact that first aid is so important, and it's clear they executed that well. What is the timeline, yeah. though, for when Hamlin might be able to breathe on his own? Because while doctors are saying he is making progress, the reality is he still has a tube, as you mentioned. No, and, and that's the next big step, though they won't put any timeline on it. What I can tell you is that his le oxygen levels have gone up dramatically over the last 36 hours. We talked about that yesterday, how he had cut the oxygen use in half since when he was admitted, and, and now those oxygen levels continue to climb. So they're, they're very excited a about the possibility of removing that breathing tube, but he's mm -hmm. still using that ventilator uh, right now, and, and that speaks to the fact that they said he's still in critical condition. So there's still a lot to work through here. We don't want people to think that he's going to walk out of this hospital anytime soon because that's not going to be the case. But but the fact of the matter is, Zinclair, that he actually is on the path to a full recovery. That's the hope. And that's something we didn't know 24 hours ago. Oh, well, Jay, thank you so much. Of course, we're keeping him in our thoughts and prayers. And thanks for staying on it. Thanks. And the White House is leaning on a Trump-era border policy. The administration today says people crossing illegally from Cuba, Haiti, and Nicaragua will be sent back. But he is not shutting the door completely on immigration. The U.S. will let 30,000 people in per month to work legally. Here's NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. President Biden's visit to the border will come this Sunday, all of it after the president has faced fierce criticism over his handling of the border crisis, where there has been a record number of illegal border crossings. President Biden tonight announcing that he will expand efforts to quickly expel migrants from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela who come here illegally, as he warned migrants today in remarks, do not just show up. Still, he says the U.S. will allow up to 30,000 migrants from those countries to come to the U.S. each month through a newly expanded vetting process. This weekend, as for that trip, the president is expected to stop in El Paso, Texas, where the shelters have been overwhelmed by a surge of migrants. The city's Democratic mayor has declared a state of emergency. Back to you. That was NBC's Peter Alexander. And now to the royal drama playing out over Prince Harry's upcoming memoir. In it, Harry says his brother, Prince William, physically attacked him during an argument. The book, set to be released on Tuesday, is already circulating in Spain, and NBC News has obtained a copy. Keir Simmons is in London with more on the explosive allegations. Hey there, well, we're now getting an avalanche of accusations from Prince Harry in his book, where... He didn't really make any headlines in his Netflix docu-series with Meghan. He certainly is with the book, and they are coming out earlier than expected. It was supposed to be published next week, but it was sold in bookshops in Spain, Spanish language copies that have now been bought by many news organizations and are being poured over. NBC News has managed to obtain a copy. And so we now know that Prince Harry does say in the book that there was a violent altercation between him and his brother in which Prince William pushed Prince Harry over, according to Prince Harry's account. We know that the book does go into very personal detail about Prince Harry's life, including that at one point he took cocaine. We know that in the book there is the allegation uh, that when he wore a Nazi uniform when he was a teenager and was condemned for it and had to apologize that in fact he says William and Kate laughed at his uh, outfit for a party. In other words suggesting that they agree with it. We know that in the book he does say that both Prince William and himself Prince Harry urged their father, the now King King Charles not to marry Camilla, now the Queen uh, Consort. And, and the list goes on and on of, of claims made and accusations. He is saying in a television interview that will be broadcast over the weekend that it's not clear whether he will make it to the coronation uh, this year. And perhaps that isn't surprising because uh, this really does expose, if it wasn't already clear, the enormous rift between Prince Harry and his brother. He documents what he says are uh, claims made by Prince William uh, about his wife, uh, nasty things said that led to some of these uh, arguments to, to Prince William's uh, temper in the arguments between them, according to uh, Prince Harry. So there is now so much that has been said. I think one of the real questions is, uh, how can the rift ever be 
healed. Uh, I think another question is one of the really damaging accusations that Prince Harry has made consistently and he makes again now in this book is that his own family briefed the media against him. Now, if that is the case, of course, it does I expose uh, pretty, uh, pretty appalling behaviour inside uh, the royal palaces, but we haven't had a comment from Buckingham Palace. Uh, we reached out to uh, Prince William's uh, people, no comment from them either. So we just don't have the other side of the story. And I think that is a very crucial point at this stage. Important analysis from Keir Simmons in London. Thank you so much. And up next, we're back in the U.S. with a big question. Should the electric chair or firing squad be legal in executions? And why can't officials get access to lethal injection drugs? That's what the South Carolina Supreme Court is debating today. Now tonight continues right after the break. Welcome back. I'm Zinclair Samwan. We're heading to South Carolina, where the state Supreme Court is hearing arguments on the death penalty, specifically whether a 2,000 volt electric chair or a three person firing squad violates the state's constitutional provisions against cruel and unusual punishment. It might seem archaic, but death by firing squad is actually available to death row inmates in three states in the U.S. This all comes after a lower court judge in the state declared both execution methods unconstitutional just last, last year. The problem is lethal injection is not readily available in South Carolina, and the state can't obtain the drugs to use for it. Joining me now to talk about this is Danny Savalos, an NBC News legal analyst, and Kyra Eisner, an investigative reporter at NPR. Thank you both for being here. So, Danny, let's start with you. How exactly did this, this, uh, this case end up in the Supreme Court? And talk to us about the lower case process of this as well. It's fascinating. The lower court concluded that execution by firing squad, squad and electrocution were both unconstitutional. Constitutional. And what's critical here is it's not just the United States Constitution. It was unconstitutional under the South Carolina State Constitution. Uh, why that's significant is that the U.S. Constitution is said to provide the floor for constitutional protections, but states can decide to provide more protection. In a way, they are the ceiling. So oftentimes, a criminal defendant may not find any protections in the Constitution, but their state constitution may protect them. And that's what the lower court concluded here. And what's fascinating about this to me is that the court concludes that at least one method of execution, electrocution, has been around for a long time. Uh, firing squad has also been around for a long time, but it's not used that commonly. Mm. However, historically, firing squad was used in the military, for example, to punish deserters. So mm. there is a his historical precedent for both, even though firing squad we've used I think three times since 1966. Right, it's rare. But it's a very interesting thing that the court concluded under the South Carolina Constitution that it was cruel and unusual punishment as defined by the South Carolina Constitution. Okay, important legal analysis. Kiara, I want to bring you in because I know you've done a lot of reporting, speaking to the staff who actually perform many of these executions, whether by injection or strapping these individuals into electric chairs. So what is the most prevalent method for the death penalty across the U.S.? And what has your reporting told you? Sure. Um, I just wanted to agree with Danny, who mentioned that the states do often provide extra protections, and that's the case in South Carolina. The South Carolina Constitution actually requires that there not be cruel, unusual, or corporal punishment, which is different from the U.S. Constitution. And corporal just means anything affecting the body. So you can understand why the judge there um, decided that the firing squad and the electric chair were not uh, in accordance with the South Carolina Constitution. Um, lethal injection is the most common method across the U.S. right now. And Kiara, I wanted to also ask you, why is South Carolina having such a hard time obtaining the drugs for lethal injection? We don't know why that is in South Carolina in particular, but the reason why most states have trouble when they do say that they're having difficulty obtaining the drugs is because every single major pharmaceutical company has gone out and said that they do not want their drugs to be used to kill people in executions. Mm. So that puts these states in a difficult position where some of their uh, laws state that they have to execute people, but they're not allowed to use the drugs that are pharmaceutically available. So oftentimes they have to get them from means that uh, are sometimes extra legal. Um, there's not a clear way 
how they're getting these drugs. We don't know. Um, and sometimes they can be extremely expensive. Essentially, they're just very difficult to obtain because the pharmaceutical companies have decided that they do not want their drugs to be used for executions. Mm, that's an important point. And Danny, I want to bring you back in here because once the judge makes their decision, what happens and what are the national implications too? Possible appeal to the Supreme Court, arguably because this is in South Carolina state court, it may not affect legally as precedent anything beyond South Carolina. But morally, so to speak, or for a nation, this may be the first of many cases to come. I just want to point out one more thing that Kiara said that was absolutely right. She, the South Carolina Constitution adds that magic word corporal. Mm -hmm. And in addition, whereas the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says it has to be cruel and unusual. The South Carolina Constitution uses the disjunctive. So you have cruel or unusual mm. or corporal. And corporal is sort of like beatings, right? And yeah. that's sort of... Uh, but any of those will be a violation of the South Carolina Constitution. And through that, you can see how a state constitution can provide significantly more protection for someone than the U.S. Constitution. So somebody in a neighboring state without those same provisions, they don't get the same protections. Mm, that's an important point. And Kiara, I wanted to end with you. I know you've spoken with a lot, as I said earlier, of individuals who do this work, right, who uh, do these executions. What's one of your biggest learnings from your time reporting on this? People who have to carry out executions have told me that they suffer extensively. They suffer mentally, physically, emotionally. Uh, almost everyone I spoke to told me that they suffer extensive trauma after having to carry out these executions. And not a single person who I spoke to whose jobs actually required them to be inside the death chamber. That means they were working either as an executioner or as a doctor or as a nurse or just as a, a correctional officer. Not a single person who had to be in the room while it was happening told me that they now support the death penalty. Even people who were in favor of it before they started those jobs. So it affects them physically, mentally, emotionally, and it changes their political opinion on the death penalty, just to be involved. Kiara Eisner, Danny Savalos, important analysis. Thank you both so much. And it's the first week of January, and many Americans are thinking about New Year's resolutions. I know I am, and there's a popular one. No more drinking or a dry January. But for the 14 million people with alcohol use disorder, a dry January can fear, feel nearly impossible. Tonight, a behind-the-scenes look at a cutting-edge lab that's developing medical treatments to help Americans stay dry. NBC's Kate Snow has more. This might look like any neighborhood watering hole, with beer taps and shots being poured, but it's not what it looks like. This is not a real bar. This is an experimental bar we use for our clinical studies. We're at the National Institutes of Health, where Dr. Lorenzo Leggio uses the bar to study new drugs for alcohol use disorder, as excessive drinking is up more than 20% during the pandemic. We've been seeing increases in the number of death certificates associated with alcohol, increases in hospitalizations, increases in liver disease, the full gamut, basically. Dr. George Koob is director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. There are three medications that have been approved by the FDA, and I think most Americans aren't really aware of that. But they don't work for everyone, and some cause difficult side effects, which is why the NIH is trying to expand the pool, testing several drugs, including one that blocks the hunger hormone, to see if it can work for alcohol, too. The hope is that in the future, we will have many more medications to choose from. And that's where the bar comes in. Everything is actually fake here. Bottles are filled with food coloring. The taps pour no beer. Study participants are shown their drink of choice, but those drinks are never consumed. And that right there is a double-sided mirror so that researchers can be watching how they react. And we want to see if our treatment may help people to reduce craving, to reduce alcohol drinking. Reduce the craving. Correct. For 63-year-old Mark Robbins, it worked. He joined a study that tested a drug that manipulates the hunger hormone when he found himself drinking more than usual during the pandemic. I wasn't looking to quit drinking. I was just kind of looking to get back to pre-pandemic um, normalcy. While Robbins took a pill for two weeks, the lifelong drinker says he didn't have a single drink. I was pleasantly surprised not having uh, any uh, cravings for, for alcohol or specifically my martini. And since the experiment, he says he drinks less than he was during the pandemic. 
Another drug the NIH looked at that's typically used to treat high blood pressure also showed promising results for alcohol. What would you say to doubters who would say, well, a pill's not going to fix somebody who has an alcohol dependency? I would say, you are right. Pills are not going to fix everything, but pills, medications, are going to help people to fix the problem. The medications they're studying could be years away, but the NIH wants to raise awareness for patients and even doctors that there are options to help. Kate Snow, NBC News, Baltimore. Thanks, Kate, for that report. Now, how do you determine the difference between fact and opinion? New Jersey is now the very first state that will require students to learn information literacy. That story before we go. There's a new class in town, math, science, and now information and media literacy. New Jersey will soon require curriculum to help students spot misinformation online. The first of its kind law is thought to be an important step for the future of democracy. NBC's Dasha Burns has more. We're going to check to make sure it's credible. Identifying credible sources. There's a lot out there on social media that's true and a lot that you have to fact check. Finding evidence. Librarian Lisa Manganello is teaching these essential skills to these juniors at South Brunswick High, helping them discern fact from fiction and everything in between when consuming the news. I want them to be curious about the world, but to do it in a way that's uh, smarter than, than some Americans may be doing it right now. This kind of lesson will soon be mandated for all K-12 through students across New Jersey, thanks to a bill just signed by the governor with bipartisan support. It was spearheaded by the state librarians and Manganello's class will serve as a framework for the new statewide curriculum on information literacy. We want to make sure that they have the skills they need to survive and cope and thrive in an environment where media is going to be thrown at them constantly. Increasing social media news consumption should come as a surprise to no one. According to a 2021 Pew survey, almost half of all American adults get their news from social media. And a recent Ofcom report found that in the UK, more teens are getting their news from social media than from traditional news sources, with Instagram being the most popular. TikTok and YouTube are right behind. I mostly get a lot of information over TikTok and Instagram got so much information too. And I'm more like a visual and verbal learner, so YouTube is also like my go-to. How hard is it to sort of figure out what's true, what's not, what's fact, what's fiction when you're online? Nowadays it's very hard. As technology advances, more people are able to Photoshop stuff and make more people believe it. I believe that this class is actually very like insightful and important because I literally did not think of any of the things Ms. Manganello was able to like teach us, and I feel like more people should have this class. The tools that helped these students think more critically will soon be available across New Jersey schools as it becomes the first state requiring districts to teach information literacy. At the heart of the bill is information. We will look at print materials, we will look at digital materials, but at the heart of it is understanding um, what is true and what is real information and what is distorted. When you look at what these kids are learning, these kids that are soon going to be voting age, mm -hmm. it, is there hope here? <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know that our students are, are really going to make change, important change in the world, and we're giving them the tools to be able to do that. Thanks, Dasha Burns, for that report and an exciting opportunity for those students. Now, the sun has set and we begin watching. We've been watching the news all day just for you. So here's some of the stuff we think you have got to see. In New Jersey, a car plunged 21 feet over the edge of a road while fleeing from police. Just before the new year, officers approached a stolen vehicle and the driver attempted to take off. It hit several parked cars before going over a retaining wall. The driver managed to free himself but was later apprehended by officers, both the driver and his passenger were taken into custody. In North Carolina, security cameras captured lightning striking a truck yesterday. It took place at a professional racing company co-owned by NASCAR Hall of Fame members Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Rick Hendricks. 
The strike left behind sparks and a cloud of smoke. There have been no reports of injuries. And a tornado caused some serious damage at a school's football field in Arkansas. Caught on camera, you can see it moving across the field as light poles struggle to withstand the winds. Storms hit the area yesterday, leaving a path of damage in its wake. And that's just some of the stories you have got to see. Thank you so much for joining us and ending your day right with Now Tonight. I'm Zinclair Samoa. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.